My name is Mike Lehan. Uh, I'm a software engineer, CTO at Students.com. Uh, we are basically Airbnb for students. I'm a skydiver and I'm a northerner, unless you've come from Scandinavia today. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at M1KE. I love feedback. All the speakers here love feedback. So there's a link on Joined In. Um, if you haven't used Joined In before, then how have you been reviewing all the other talks you've seen? But go to Joined In at the end of the conference and review everyone's talks. Speakers really appreciate it. Now, we're talking about real-time web applications today, and people ask me the question, isn't it all real-time, right? We're doing communication. Communication generally is real-time. You talk to people, you communicate, you send a text, you have a phone call, it's real-time. You're using the internet right now. Some of you may be right now on Twitter ignoring me. Isn't it all real-time? Well, I want to clarify what I mean when I say real-time web applications. Um, when you do front-end work, hands up here who does JavaScript, OK, some people, some people seem ashamed about that. It's not a thing to be ashamed about. We're doing some JavaScript today. And we're doing JavaScript to handle interactive web pages. So uh, whether it's the old school version of using jQuery or the new school version of using React or whatever else they cook up in the next few years, we are doing interactive web pages. But these are all event-based operations. They respond only to your user doing something. A user clicks a button, and a thing happens. A user types a message, and a thing happens. I'm defining real-time applications as a bit more than that. They're not just interactive. They are a live conversation between the client, generally your web browser, and a server, or even between two clients, two web browsers. And so we're going to look at two real-time technologies that enable this. And they are WebSockets and WebRTC. Now, both of these have been around a while. WebSockets is definitely more established, but having reviewed a few companies that I thought would be definitely be using WebSockets in their applications, I found it's not nearly as well used as I would have imagined. Um, WebRTC is much newer, and it's a browser-to-browser -browser connection to send lots of, well, basically anything between two browsers. That's a bit more unstable, yet it's still being used by quite a lot of platforms. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about WebSockets in this talk. However, I do have a few slides at the end about WebRTC. So if we're running in good time, uh, I'll get to talk about WebRTC. If we're not running in good time, uh, they will cut me off and kick me out of the room. Um, and I will then go to the speaker's corner, and you can come and ask me about WebRTC. And I'll tell you everything you need to know about it there. So uh, what qualifies me to speak on this, other than the fact that I have a jacket? Well, I have built a live chat tool for users of our application. Um, we found that in the property market, one of the biggest problems was people wanted to inquire about properties. They would send a message, and then three days later, they would get a message back saying, sorry, we're out of the office, uh, which wasn't very helpful for converting people from wanting to get into a property to being in the property. Um, we built a live chat system. Uh, we knew all our student users were on Facebook using Facebook chat in their browsers. Um, we built the same thing. We copied their entire UI, because why not? And we built it with WebSockets. And that was our first interface with WebSockets. Um, we host it on the smallest possible DigitalOcean droplet. Um, and we've had no outages with up to 1,000 concurrent connections, which is fairly impressive for a $5 server. Um, it is the most stable part of our entire architecture, and it's the cheapest thing to run. So WebSockets is a very good technology if you use it correctly. Um, WebSockets fits really well as well into the microservice style of architecture. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. So yeah, we send hundreds of messages per day. We're not exactly Facebook in terms of our message volumes, um, but we're still facilitating a lot of useful uh, chats for our clients. Um, we also do video calls. Um, this is still in beta on our platform, um, but it's basically the idea that you've been speaking to someone, maybe someone you want to live with, and obviously you know, all the messages are great, but you want to make sure that they're not actually uh, impersonating someone or just someone that you feel you can get on with, face-to-face -face conversation, eye contact, all those wonderful things that we try and avoid as developers. Um, and so we can go from text to video uh, using WebRTC. Um, and that's in a limited beta release, but we use it internally. We have two offices, and we have a permanent video link between the two running on our own WebRTC platform, which has been a really good way of testing the stability of a WebRTC connection when you have it running uh, all the time for three years. Um, so we're going to build a system today together. You don't need to get your laptops out. You're just going to follow along. And like all good developers, we're going to start with a specification. What are we going to build? Generally, you will need to know this before you start building things. Hopefully, that's all how you work in your companies. If it's not, there are other great talks that talk about getting that sort of stuff stored. So we need a list of requirements. What are we doing? And we're going to look also at different technologies. Don't just assume that because I'm talking on WebSockets, that's the best thing to use. We're going to look at what else we could use as well. So here's a simple specification for a live chat system, things that I think are fairly basic that anyone can do in a live chat system. Send and receive messages. Maintain privacy. I think that's pretty important. Hopefully, most of you agree. Store chat history. That is fairly useful, although sometimes can conflict with the privacy goal and indicate who is online so that people know when they're having a live conversation or when they're sending a message that's still going to end up in someone's inbox. 
And we can accomplish this with the technologies we already know. Any of you, if I told you this specification, could probably use what you know with front-end JavaScript and server-side uh, server PHP in order to accomplish this specification. You'd send a message via asynchronous HTTP, more commonly referred to as AJAX. You can authenticate your request at your application level. You can check for messages on some sort of schedule, so you use uh, set timeout or set interval in your JavaScript code to just check every now and then in case there's a new message. You save messages to some sort of shared data store, um, and then you can record the user's presence by just recording when these requests are coming through, uh, kind of like a keep alive system. So, well done, we can all build that, we can go home, you can all leave this talk early, we're good, right? Well, not quite. Um, do you slow down your server or your users? Well, what do I mean by this? You've just said you're going to send an Ajax request for every chat every, say, 30 seconds, um, but now your users have to wait 30 seconds before someone sends them a message. How often have you been typing a message into WhatsApp or some other chat application, and you've seen that the other person starts typing, and you think, oh, I'll just wait and still see what they're saying before I say my thing, because maybe they'll change the whole game of the conversation. And then the message just doesn't come through. And it's been a few minutes, it's been a few minutes more, you're still sitting there, and then you realize that they can see your typing too. Mexican standoff. Who's going to send their message first? Um, and what this does is create a weird, slow conversation response. And this is the exact same thing you get if you try and do slow polling to find out if people have sent you messages. By the time someone's queued up the next three messages to send, they've sent them and the other person's already sent messages that conflict with that and you end up with a really weird conversation. Um, so the frequency of requests versus chats either means you have wasted requests, so say you send one every second. Well, your users are probably on average not sending a message a second unless they're having some sort of crazy emoji battle. Um, so you're either wasting requests and that's going to hammer your server or your users think everything is slow. Um, and yeah, as the SAD server says, in the cloud, no one can hear you scream. So we need a better solution, and that's where WebSockets just come in. WebSockets is a standard totally independent of HTTP. Um, it can include an initial handshake request done over HTTP, um, but after that, it's its own connection, own servers, everything can be separate with WebSockets. It still operates over SSL, so you have WS is a standard uh, prefix, and WSS for secure. Um, and it can use your regular SSL certificates that you have on your web server. Um, it's built into all modern browsers, um, and it's accessible via JavaScript and an API. There's also a thing called WAMP. WAMP is a great name. WAMP stands for the Web Application Messaging Protocol. And basically, WebSockets as a base level just defines a connection. It defines the base level that two people can do a handshake and exchange security certificates, but other than that, it doesn't say what they're going to do over that connection. WAMP says what they're going to do over that connection. Just like with HTTP, you have headers, you have responses, you have bodies, requests, all those things that we know about, verbs, status codes. WAMP defines that for WebSockets. WAMP was uh, invented by a company called uh, Crossbar initially, but it's generally an open standard that lots of people contribute to. Um, Crossbar themselves are an interesting company. We use Crossbar services, um, so I'm just gonna kind of break down. They found their company and their system are so complicated, they made their own diagram to explain who they are. Um, so they have Crossbar IO, which is a router, and then Crossbar IO, which confusingly is also a company. Then they have Autobahn, which is a Python library that powers the router and also a JavaScript library, because why not name them different things? Um, and then they all implement WAMP, and then they also specify WAMP. It's kind of weird, but it's nice that they thought ahead and made a diagram like this rather than just fixing their structure. Um, <laughs> and so what are we actually going to build? Um, we're going to build this. This is our system diagram. Um, all looks very nice. I've got some boxes, even some dotted lines. No expense spared on this presentation. Um, and this area here is our network. And when I say our network, I don't mean it has to be our single physical data center. This network could be all on one machine. It could be a virtual private network created in a cloud host. It could be our own data center. It could be your office. It could be anything. I'm just saying our network to differentiate it from the outside world where our users are. Um, so again, these different boxes, these different items, these days could be anything. They could be physical servers, virtual hosts, Docker containers. Um, I've just tried to roughly get them in a place that looks sensible from how they're working. And then we do the easy thing of linking them all together. Um, and it ends up looking a little bit confusing, um, but that's nothing that a good telecoms engineer couldn't fix. So rather than do that, we're gonna break it down a little bit more for you. Um, so those people who are taking photos of this bit, it might be easier if you do it at the end when you know more about what's going on. Um, so we're gonna start with something we all know, a HTTP request. Our user comes to our website, makes a HTTP request to get a page from us. User's loading a web page from our web server. 
And we're assuming these users are authenticated. Okay? You can do this totally unauthenticated, but we're going to talk about privacy later, and that generally needs to mean you know who you're talking to. So a user authenticates with our database, um, and then we get a response sent to the user. We just sent them a web page. Again, something you should probably all be familiar with. And now we make a WebSocket connection. So the JavaScript that we've just downloaded to our user's browser runs and runs to connect to WebSocket server. Um, and it establishes a connection. And now, if we're assuming our server and our client implement WAMP, we can carry out all the actions defined by WAMP. So the important thing there to know is, what is WAMP? Well, WAMP has two main features. The first is PubSub. Again, you could have across this in a variety of different contexts. Um, PubSub is publish and subscribe. And for anyone who's used something like an event bus, this might be familiar to you. Um, you subscribe to a named topic. So it's just a string, just a name. Um, generally, the WAMP protocol doesn't say that you have to subscribe to a topic that exists in any sense. If you subscribe to a topic by the fact you have subscribed, it now exists. Um, and then you can also publish to the a same topic, or you can publish to a different topic and hope someone else is subscribed to that. And then the message is relayed by the router to everyone else subscribed. And this is a really simple uh, architecture. Um, it would also be familiar for internal operations with things like messaging components. Um, and hopefully it's not too complicated to understand how it works. Um, it can also be used to handle, yeah, microservice architectures. Um, and here's some code. This is in uh, JavaScript to say how we do this. So this would be on the user side on their browser. So we have connection on open. So like a lot of things in JavaScript, you've got a lot of callbacks. Um, at some point, these things may be replaced with some async await fun, but for now, only callbacks. Um, and then we have an on open. So when your connection is established, it runs some stuff. So then you can start doing things like, I'm going to subscribe to this topic. I'm going to publish this topic. Or I'm going to tell my user that I'm subscribed, and we can start doing some work. Um, we can subscribe. So there we go. We've got a named thread. I've called it my app thread one because I'm imaginative. Um, and all we're going to do when we get a message is log it to the console, because we assume our users are highly technical and have the console open at all times. Um, and then we can also publish to the exact same thing. Um, this array that we're publishing here uh, is just an array. It can send anything. I've put a string in it, because that seems sensible. You can put other data in it. You can uh, send objects um, that will be serialized as JSON. Um, so it's quite flexible in terms of what you can do with it. The other main tool of WAMP is RPC, Remote Procedure Call. Um, RPC is getting a little bit more talk at the moment um, with the libraries like gRPC, uh, which again has become very common to use in, in um, microservice architectures. Um, but RPC itself is a procedure that has been around for a long time. Um, if anyone remembers Windows XP, there was a terrible RPC bug that allowed everyone to get infected with a virus around 2002, 2003, I think. Um, so Microsoft clearly on it with RPC. Um, you can register a procedure. So you say, this is a procedure. You have some code on your machine. You give it a name, and that's it. Now, any other user connected to the service can call your procedure. So they say, I'm calling this procedure. They don't have to say who they're calling it on. So the server can only register one procedure with the same name from one user. And then they send some arguments. And again, those arguments can be strings. They can be integers. They can be booleans. They can be anything that you can send down a connection. Um, and then the procedure is carried out on the client's machine. Um, and it returns the message. Now, a key thing to say here is that the code here is not executed on the crossbar server. Some people have said, isn't this a security hole? Essentially, it's like sending someone some, you know, agreeing that someone's going to send you some code, and you're just going to run eval on it without looking at it. Um, don't do that. Um, this is running on the person's computer. So if you've got client A over here, register procedure. Client B calls it. That code runs on client A's computer. So if you decide to register a procedure called mine Bitcoin, people will mine Bitcoin on your machine. You're not doing something clever and mining Bitcoin on anyone else's machine. Um, and here's some code that does the exact same thing we saw with PubSub, but this time it's in PHP. Um, and so a similar thing, we can register a procedure. So we're going to add some numbers together, because people really need to use someone else's computer to add numbers together. And then someone else can call the procedure to add those numbers. And we have a then, which either echoes a result or calls an error. So where are we with our specification? Let's not forget our specification. How many tickets have we closed off in this session? Well, we're 25% of the way there which I think is pretty good. We can send and receive messages. However, we haven't got any privacy at this point. We saw earlier that we can subscribe to a named thread. Subscribe my app thread1. Well, what if I'm not allowed access to thread1? What if thread1 is somewhere that two people are discussing their bank details or their holiday arrangements? I just subscribe to thread1, and now I know when I can rob your house. Um, so we need some privacy. 
And generally, our applications will already have considered this. So let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's use our application. We're going to build an authenticator to connect your application that you all have to our real-time application. And this is where we're going to use workers. Crossbar can run worker scripts. These can be in any executable language on your machine. Um, and those workers can just do things. Crossbar is quite good, uh, similar to things like Upstart, that will just keep a service running for you, like a daemon. Um, but they can start it with certain arguments that can come from a crossbar configuration file. Um, and so therefore, you can use that to pass data from your config into your workers, um, things like secret keys. So you don't have to have those publicly exposed. And your worker will establish a connection the exact same way your clients do. The great thing about WebSockets is everything is equal. So your workers that are doing tasks for you on your machine and your clients that are connecting to you from their browsers have the same interface, the same API, and you just control that with the different permissions you give them. Um, so our worker needs to establish a connection. Um, we define what permissions it's allowed to do. We tell Crossbar how, how to start it. And we define the work worker as an authenticator. Now, WAMPCRA, that is a brilliant acronym and overly long for what it does. WAMPCRA is basically, I send you a challenge, you send me a response. That's it. Um, it's a way of sending uh, a secret over the network without sending the secret. Two people do some encryption on their sides, compare the encrypted values, you're good, you're authenticated, um, using random values, one-time uses, etc. cetera. Um, I won't go into the details of how it works, you can look it up fairly easily. Um, and the worker establishes a connection. We have a TCP connection. Um, the worker connects like any other client. Um, generally, obviously, it will connect on your internal network. Um, the nice thing there is that you can use different ports, so you can have those ports close off to the outside world, so some random person can't just say, hey, I'm your authenticator today, because that's not good for your security. Um, and then the worker says, I'm going to register an RPC, and you're going to use that to authenticate other users. Now, the worker here is where this whole thing fits into a PHP conference, um, because our worker is going to be written in PHP, because we're mostly PHP developers. Um, and before I talk about that, you'll be familiar with the idea that PHP is not generally a uh, language that runs long-running programs. You run a PHP script, it starts at the top, it runs to the bottom, and then it dies and exits, and it's gone. So if we want to continue running PHP, we have to do event loops. Um, an event loop, at the very simplest, is this. While true, i.e. run this forever. And then we're going to check some handlers, see if they should do, do anything. And then if they should do anything, we, we do the thing. Um, this is fairly simple. You could write an event loop to do this. You have a script that runs, and now your script will just run forever doing what it needs to do. Um, I wouldn't recommend this, though, because you might not know all you need to know about how your system works, your system's threading model, all that other fun stuff about interrupts and uh, various other things that I don't even know to even make jokes about. Um, so we're going to use a library that's pre-built for this uh, activity. And the library we chose to use um, is React PHP. Um, React PHP predates React JavaScript. I always have to say that in my talks because people see React and they go, oh, JavaScript. No, it's PHP. Um, and React PHP is a really great library for doing lots of things in PHP that PHP wasn't originally designed for. Um, so you can write an entire web server using React. You can write a WebSocket server using React. Um, you can do most things in React, and you should do because it's great. Um, there's also now Swool, um, and I'm sure there are other implementations that of uh, asynchronous PHP libraries, socket libraries that people know of. But I like React, so I'm going to keep talking about it. Here's an example of someone making a uh, connection in React. And you'll also notice that we've got a new namespace coming in here where we say new throughway. Um, throughway is basically a copy of the Autobahn Python library into PHP. So it's just someone's looked at the Python and then gone, OK, let's implement all that stuff with the same interface, same API, same names in PHP, uh, which is really great that people have done that. Um, so it's not by the same people who do Autobahn and Crossbar, but it matches it almost exactly. If you can do the JavaScript side of it, you can do the PHP side of it, and vice versa. Um, so we are open a connection. We can handle errors of the connection. And then we can say, let's open that connection. Um, so these are the PHP libraries we're actually using. Um, React, I've already mentioned. Um, Ratchet is basically the bit of React that talks to WebSockets. Um, so React can talk natively to WebSockets, but Ratchet adds a few extra features. And then Throughway, which is all our WAMP implementation. Um, generally, if you do Composer install Throughway, uh, Composer will install Ratchet and React for you. Um, but if you want to do just a few of these things without using Throughway, without the whole WAMP protocol, you can use the other libraries if you want to. If you wanted to write your own router, um, I would recommend using Ratchet. And now we can go back to our system diagram. We're going to add an extra step in between our first two parts. The JS establishes a WebSocket connection, but then Crossbar authenticates with our application. 
And we basically send a message uh, from our application to the router. The router talks to the worker. Um, and then the worker is going to talk to our web server. Our web server communicates with our database, talks back to the worker, says this person is authenticated or they're not, and then sends a response back to the client. So the client is now told, hey, you're authenticated. Um, and again, at that point, no secret has passed across the wire because we've encrypted it on both sides and compared that instead. So uh, obviously, you're using SSL connection anyway, but you know, let's minimize the risk to our users. So this can be a bit complicated when I show it with arrows, so I'm going to show it on a big table instead. So the user requests a web page for our application. Now, the application also needs to do something here to make sure the user can re-authenticate. The user shouldn't send their password with every WebSocket connection request. So in our case, we just generate a one-time use token for that user to do their next WebSocket authentication. This could be a one-time use token. This could be a permanent token that's just separate from their password. Whatever you feel like, JSON web tokens being a big thing that people use now. So we save that auth token somewhere. We're going to save it to a database. Um, and we're going to send the page and that token. So the user now has a page with a token in it. So that page for that user is different from the same page for any other user because it has their token embedded in it. Um, and now the user asks to connect. The crossbar talks to our authenticator. The authenticator talks to our app. That gets the auth token. It returns the auth token. Verifies the auth token. And that now tells Crossbar, yeah, this person's good. Crossbar saves the permissions so the user doesn't have to keep authenticating and constantly be hitting your app because you wouldn't really want that if the user was sending lots of messages like just bombarding your app. And we say, hey, you're now signed in. And the user gets a little object at this point saying that they are signed in, saying that they've been given a named role. Um, so you know, your roles could be as simple as user, or you could have totally different uh, branches of permissions. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, and then the user can just keep doing the rest of their actions. So then it calls their onopen function in their JavaScript. So now they do whatever else they were going to do. Subscribe to some threads, uh, open up an interface that they can send chat messages through, all that good stuff. And permissions are granular. So when our configuration is set up in Crossbar, we can say something like this. Um, for a given URI, i.e. like a topic name, um, we're going to allow that user, they can't do calls or registers or subscribes, but they can do publishes. And then we have this disclose key as well. Um, disclose basically means if I send a message to the router and the router relays that message to someone else, does the other person find out that it was me that sent it? Um, generally, you'll want to disclose because conversations are better when people know who they're talking to. But if you actually want to make a system which has an anonymous chat, um, you might be working uh, in something like law enforcement where you're taking anonymous tips. Um, and then you might not want any way of connecting. Now, obviously, there's many other ways people can trace you, but turning off this would be a good step. Um, but if you, don't, if you want your users to have to disclose themselves, you turn this on. Um, if you turn it off, a user can still choose selectively to disclose themselves with an individual message, so your client could do some fun stuff with that as well. Um, slightly different configuration here. Um, you'll notice the previous configuration, we had a match prefix. So my app.keepalive, and I can send to anything prefixed with that string. My app keep alive one my app keep alive elephant, etc. Um, in this case, we're saying match exact. And this is the kind of authentication JSON we would use for a specific user being allowed to do a specific action. Um, but obviously, we have a configuration file in JSON. Configuration files in JSON can be quite scalable, but you probably have more users than you want to add a line in your configuration JSON file for each of these. That would get a little bit bulky. Um, so instead, you can just replace this entire block of JSON with a single key, authorizer. We've talked about authentication who the user is. Authorization is saying what the user can do. And in this case, you can do the exact same process we've talked about with authentication to also say, can your user subscribe to this topic? Can their user publish to this topic? Um, I won't go back over it because it is literally the same as the authentication process, but with authorization instead. Um, and I can't really spell either of those words well. Um, so we're now at this stage in our goals. We have maintained privacy. We have authentication and authorization. <coughs> and users uh, can trust who they're talking to on the server, or as much as you can trust any computer system, which is not at all. Um, and so, we're about halfway through our specification. Now we need to store some chat history, because what we don't want to hear from our users is that the system lost all their chats. They've been having a conversation about some work that's coming up. You've probably all done this on Slack. Um, and then people say, hey, instead of Slack, let's switch to a phone call. 
you switch to the phone call, you have a conversation. A week later, the other person is denying any knowledge of that phone conversation and all that work you've done on the back of it. Um, so we like the idea of persistence in the development community, I feel. Um, and it's the same with most other people's conversations. Um, things like Snapchat have popularized the disappearing message. You can do that, obviously. But to popularize the disappearing message, you probably need to have the ability to store messages for a little while to start with. So how are we going to store our chats? Because these users are communicating via this router. The router is this dumb box that just sends messages and receives messages. How are we going to find out what they're sending? Now, the router has a log file, but I would not recommend trying to store the log file. Um, I don't know what it is about crossbars log data, but it outputs the worst looking log file I think I've ever seen. Um, if you do slash n to add a new line, it just prints slash n into the log file. Uh, and I have not found a way, no matter how much I've dug through the source code, to fix that, um, which is very annoying. Um, so you just get really long log lines with stuff on it. Um, so we're going to have to do something a bit more clever. Crossbar doesn't have an API as such. So you can't just hook into Crossbar and say, hey, store all these chats to this place. Um, but what it does have are meta events. Um, if you do turn on crossbar logging and enable full debug mode, um, you will A, fill up your hard disk really fast, but also you will see that crossbar talks between its own internal components using WAMP. I think that's pretty cool. It's kind of like when you tell a uh, computer science undergraduate that you can write a C compiler in C and their head explodes. Um, so crossbar talks to its, own, to its own components using WAMP. And we can hook into that uh, with certain permissions. Crossbar can publish uh, messages when certain things happen. So a new user signs in, Crossbar can publish a message to a named internal topic. Um, you can subscribe to that. Um, you can equally find out when someone subscribes to a topic by getting a message to another topic. And similarly, you can find out when someone registered procedure. And you can also call all these individually yourself as RPC to say, hey, who's signed in right now? What's the name of this topic? Um, and I think that's a really cool feature of Crossbar. And again, you use the same code, the same things you've already used to build your application to build extra things to do more cool stuff in the background of your application. Um, so we can, ooh, I just lost my screen. Okay, we're good. No one needs to panic, calm down, stop running for the exits. Um, so this is gonna let us find out an important thing. Um, we are gonna find out who's subscribing to a chat and then we can do the very sneaky thing. Uh, that's why my screen went off because I'm about to mention the NSA. We can do the sneaky thing that the NSA would like to do, which is to listen in on all of our users' chats. Um, so here's our big table diagram again. At the start, when our server boots up, our worker subscribes to the meta topic that finds out when other people subscribe to a topic. Then someone subscribes to a topic. Great. Crossbar publishes to the meta topic. And now we see the name of the topic this person just subscribed to. And so we subscribe to the topic as well. So our worker here is now listening in on that conversation. Some time passes, and now a conversation's happening on that topic. So the user publishes a message. And that gets relayed to all subscribers, which now includes our own application. We now can send that to our own backend application, and that can store it somehow. You'll notice that I'm putting little connection uh, indicators on my arrows. Um, and a, we've got a TCP connection between our worker and our application. Um, the reason we use TCP in this case rather than HTTP uh, is because we don't want our worker to be delayed in sending lots and lots of messages. Um, a HTTP connection has a slightly higher overhead and it's harder to um, send lots of them at the same time. So we use a TCP connection um, to send messages into our application. Um, there's various debatable ways of doing things like that. Um, you can also use message queues, uh, which we actually do. Um, and then also our connection to the database. I've put a question mark because I don't really care how you connect your database. Do your thing. Um, and so we now have the ability to listen to our users' chats. And that gives us our final system diagram. We've not finished our spec yet, but it's our final system diagram. So we have our users connecting to our app, getting a message, uh, which is a web page. They use that web page to connect to a WebSocket server. That authenticates them with our application. Uh, they then uh, subscribe to a topic and we can save that. Um, and now every time they publish a message, we send it into this message queue. Um, I've not mentioned Redis yet, so we're about to. Um, the reason we use a, say, TCP in a message queue is because we don't want our messages getting delayed. Um, and we also found it added a nice block between the two applications. That if our web server went down, which was way more likely than our crossbar server, um, sticking things in a message queue just meant when the web server came back up, um, they'd get built into it. Now, our server isn't nearly as unstable now as it was when we first built this. 
Uh, but because we had an unstable system, it was nice not to lose our users' chats. Um, so you might not need a message queue. Your application architecture may be super robust, and that's awesome. Well done. Um, where are we on our goals? Oh, we've got all arrows. And we are on our goals. Right, 75%. It's a first in a degree. We could just finish now. But let's find out who's online. Who are you? Um, so one interesting thing, I told you that you have sending attribution, that disclosed publisher. But you just get an ID. And the ID isn't the user's ID on the application system. The ID is uh, the user's ID on their current session on Crossbar. Especially which means if that user is signed into Crossbar five times, they all have different IDs. And you can receive the messages on the same thread from the same user through five different connections. And again, head explodes. So we need a way to handle our application, finding out which people, sorry, our web application in, in the user's browser, finding out who you're talking to, who's sending that message. In a one-to-one -one chat, this might not be a problem, of course. But these days, as soon as you start doing one-to-one -one chats, what happens next? Well, group chats happen. And you're going to need to know who you're talking to in a group context. So we can provide users with subscription information. We have the meta events we just talked about. Unfortunately, the meta events themselves are very useful. Their permissions are not granular. So if I allow a user to call the who's online right now procedure, they can call that to get everyone who's online right now. To me, that would seem like great reconnaissance for doing something nasty to our users. Similarly, if we can find out who's subscribing to a topic, we could find out who's subscribed to every topic. Again, even if we can't subscribe to the topics ourselves, great reconnaissance for something malicious. So we can't, and you really shouldn't, give your users access to the meta events running internally inside Crossbar, even if you're tempted to. Um, but by combining those meta events with some sort of memory, the workers can then provide restrictive lookups to the client in the form of a remote procedure call. A PHP worker could just store this in its own memory. Because it's working and running, you can th stuff, put things in variables, and they'll just stay in the script. Um, hopefully, they won't be garbage collected, but they should just stay in the script. But if that worker crashes, all that data is lost. And obviously, again, we know we're not naive. We're running PHP scripts. It might well crash. Um, so we're going to use the right tool for the job again. Redis, for anyone who's not come across it, is a super fast key value store. Um, and one of its main uses, I think, is to act as a cache. You can do lots of other cool stuff with Redis. Don't get me wrong. It's great. But cache is a really good use for Redis. Um, and so we're going to build a tool with Redis um, to allow us to save data about our users and allow them to query it back. So once again, our worker registered procedure on boot. Um, and it also subscribes to our meta event. Users connect to Crossbar again. They call the authenticator. And this time, we save their session ID along with their user information. And that information is whatever we want to provide in the future about that user. It could just be their name. It could be their email address, their avatar, various things. We can just stick it into Redis. And we key it against the user's session ID in that session on Crossbar. Now our user subscribes to a topic. Topic publishes a meta event that says, hey, this person subscribed. And we can store the topic. So we now know we've got a user stored in Redis and a topic stored in Redis. And the topic is knowing the users, so it all links together. Now a user gets a message and says, I've just had this message from someone I don't know. I now call a procedure, a remote procedure call on Crossbar, uh, I, and I send the session ID of that person. Our worker receives that procedure, looks up the user in Redis, and then sends back whatever they want. So again, they can send back the name, they can send back the email address, um, you know, you can, you can data encode a PNG file and send the user's avatar back. And then hopefully that user then stores it, shows it to the uh, user's browser, and also probably caches it. So again, you're not hammering your lookup service. Um, so you'll notice I keep mentioning caching things. Like generally, we want to cache wherever we can in this kind of system. Um, crossbar, again, is a perfect example for just like caching lots of things. Um, lots of IDs are unique. Uh, it's got really good things for expiry and keeper lives and stuff like that. So yeah, cache wherever you can. Just you know, reduce the load on your server, even if it is very powerful. Um, and so here's a bit of code that we would have used to do that previous work. So this is at the top, our PHP code, which is doing our user procedure registration. And you can see that we basically register a procedure that gets two arguments, a thread ID and a publisher, which is a session ID. And then we run a procedure in our application that I've just called get name for thread. Seemed to make sense. And then in our JS, we have a thread ID. And then we just call app users with the ID and the publisher of the message we just got. And then we can print out to our console again, message was from this person. OK. We have found out who's online. I should just mention keeper lives. When we initially implemented our WebSocket system, 
we decided that because we were storing all this stuff in, in Redis, um, we wanted to know that the user was still online. And we decided, oh, great, OK, we'll make another topic that user will ping messages to that's like a keep alive. And then we can listen to that. And then we can like store the last time a user was active. And then we can like refresh them and remove them from cache. We did all this stuff. And then we found out that Crossbar can also publish an event when the user drops off. Even if they do something like close their browser or their internet dies, Crossbar has its own internal Keep Alive system that we weren't aware of. So don't start doing this and influencing your own full Keep Alive system. Crossbar's already got that covered for you. Um, that's often what you find with the Crossbar documentation. It can, stuff can be a bit buried in it. They couldn't be writing their documentation. But it'll do most things you want it to do. So how are we doing our goals? Yes, 100%. Not test coverage, no. Um, but 100% of our goals are completed, so it's time to ship it. What have we done then? Um, let's go over what we've done. We've produced a live chat system. We used Crossbar as a WAMP router, Autobahn JS on the client side, then Thruway, Ratchet, and React on the server side. Um, we used a message queue. Uh, I haven't really spoken about that, but message queues are a really good way to start storing some of this data and make sure that your systems don't break if, they, uh, if one part goes down, the other doesn't. Um, and we've integrated it with an existing web application. And I should just stress that bit again. What I'm not telling you here is all to go away, throw your code out, and build something brand new, um, replacing what you've already done. But what I am saying is you can really easily sideload WebSockets onto something you're already doing. Um, if you've already got something that does repeated polls for a server to get new information, replace that with WebSockets. Um, your users will have a better experience, and actually your architecture will benefit from it because you will be starting to separate things that previously might have been very coupled together. Um, so this is more robust, scalable, and it's instant when compared to a basic web application. And we can build lots of other things. Um, and I say, if you haven't touched things like message queues, if you haven't touched things like um, microservice architectures, event buses, this is a really good chance to explore those as well. Um, because WebSockets just gives you a total playground you can use for doing anything in real time. We have a bit of extra time now, so I'm going to talk about WebRTC. Um, this is definitely the, well, I said the new hotness. It's not new anymore. WebRTC has been around about a decade now. Um, 2010 was when it sort of officially came into the public light. Um, Google um, acquired the early libraries for RTC by buying a VoIP company. Um, so good job, Google. Um, capitalism, yay. Um, since then, W3C has begun a full specification for WebRTC. Um, as of today, nine years later, we are on release candidate two. So we're doing well on that. Um, <laughs> there are implementations available in Firefox and Chrome. And there is now, thankfully, when I wrote this talk, there wasn't an early implementation available in Safari as well. Um, where does PHP come into WebRTC? Well, it kind of doesn't. Um, WebRTC is about browser-to-browser -browser communication. WebRTC is basically about cutting you all out of the loop. No, not really. But WebRTC is about a direct link between two browsers. And that's really great for some things. If you want your users to do video chats, the bandwidth you require on your servers to send all that video data is really huge. If you wondered why every service now has started offering free video calls, it's because everyone's trying to get into WebRTC. Um, and once you can do that through users' browsers, um, you reduce your bandwidth costs massively. Um, and so we actually do use PHP and servers. Um, it's this whole thing about serverless that's serverless with servers. Um, we have a few different servers you might need to do WebRTC implementation. Um, signaling. This is basically two people saying, hey, I want to connect to you. We need to know who we're talking to, we, unless you just want to randomly connect your users, and that's maybe strange. Um, so hooking together two browsers requires a signaling service. Where am I? What am I doing? What are we talking about? Are we sending video to each other? Are we sending audio? Are we sending files? Are we sending Bitcoin? I keep mentioning Bitcoin. Please, someone give me Bitcoin. Um, these signaling services are ideal to send over WebSockets. Um, so we've already built a WebSocket server. Great. We can start doing WebRTC right now with our WebSocket server. You come across these terms, stun and ice. Um, they are not wrestlers. They are systems in use uh, to find out the optimal path between two networks. Um, Google at the moment provide free stun servers. So if you're doing WebRTC, part of your RTC connection string will involve setting stun servers. Look up Google stun servers. I assume that they're doing something evil somewhere with the data, but never mind. Stun servers. Um, they are, there's no actual user data going between them, just, just IP addresses and locations and network paths. Um, and then you send these things called ICE candidates, which are hugely long blocks of JSON. Um, never try and read through an ICE candidate. It's really weird. 
Now, TURN. TURN is a weird one. Um, some networks don't play well with WebRTC. If you're working at a university or you're working in a large corporation um, who have symmetric NAT on your outbound firewall, you will find yourself at a loss when it comes to WebRTC. Um, because those systems remap ports, uh, your connection, your video connection ends up on one port on the way in and another on the way out, and it misses the target user, uh, basically. Um, I'm not a network person. Talk to Wim Godin afterwards if you want to know more about that. Um, but turn servers can be used here. What's turn? Turn is a fancy way of saying all your bandwidth belong to us. Um, turn basically relays all the video and everything via a server again. So you're back to square one with certain people who have symmetric NAT on their networks. Um, we work for a student property company and we built this system and then we realized that Symmetric Now was very popular at universities, so go us for research. Um, and there's a few other gotchas with WebRTC, I have to mention. Um, it's supported in a lot of places, but it isn't the best supported tool. Um, there are differing implementations, differing bugs. Testing WebRTC is an absolute pain because uh, you, you will generally test it in your office and it will work perfectly and then someone will go down the road on a 4G connection and the whole thing breaks. Um, yeah, it is, it is a, a tough thing to get into. It's quite demoralizing sometimes building WebRTC. It's been implemented by lots of people. Google Hangouts, Slack, Skype, Discord. They've all invested heavily into the ecosystem, but there's not a huge amount of people publishing a lot about what they've done, I think, because they realize the value of it at the moment. Um, Safari tends to lag behind, especially on iOS. It does support it now, um, but it, it tends to lag and has its own little quirks. So there's a lot of confusion about permissions to access users' camera phone, camera phone, camera and microphone uh, from the browser. Safari, again, in particular, um, even if you don't want to use the user's microphone or camera, you have to ask for the permission before Safari will let you open a WebRTC connection, which makes no sense to me because Apple are all about privacy. And so now apps have to ask for things they don't even intend to use, which is weird, but there's probably a reason. Um, if you are getting into this, callstats.io, Absolutely brilliant service. You plug it in, it monitors all your WebRTC connection attempts, what ha what's happening to your users, how many users' connections are dropping. Uh, it's really great for that. Uh, it's quite expensive, but again, if you're doing WebRTC, you probably have a business reason for it. Um, and Twilio now have ready-made RTC packages. Um, so you can speak to people from Twilio about that. Obviously, there's a cost, as with everything, but uh, it might be better than implementing it yourself because it can seem simple to start with and it rapidly gets quite complicated. Um, so I'm about done. Um, thank you very much for listening. As I mentioned before, you can find me on Twitter, at M1KE. Uh, I hang around on Slack, the PHP Northwest uh, in Manchester uh, and around the northwest of the UK. Slack channel and OG AWS. For anyone who's on AWS um, or using AWS, uh, I hang out there. I see lots of other smart people uh, who know lots about AWS. So come and join in the community, ask your questions about AWS. Um, please, again, rate my talk on Joined In um, if you liked it. If you didn't like it, um, I'd love to know why in either of those cases. Um, and the same for all the other talks you have seen. Uh, it is really valuable. My slides are already up at speakerdeck.com, keeping it real time. Um, and I have time for one question, I think. But afterwards, I will then go over to Speaker's Corner where you can talk to me in uh, more detail if you want. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah, one question. Who's it going to be? Doesn't have to be any of you. There we go. <laughs> So the question is, um, is the user that I've stored in Redis redundant if the user has multiple sessions? Um, no, they're not, because each of those users has their own session ID on the crossbar router. And each of those sessions a single user has could be talking and subscribing to different people. So I might be on your server from my laptop and my phone. And I might be having a conversation with one person on my laptop, one person on my phone. In a sense, as far as crossbar is concerned, those are just different people. Only, they only have the same user ID when it gets down to your application level. So they authenticate with the same user ID, but as Crossbar is concerned, they are separate connections. Crossbar just treats a connection as a user. Um, so they are still valuable to store that in Redis. Now, obviously, you could start doing some stuff where if you're storing a lot of user data in Redis for each user, you do a sort of double mapping. So you store user, and then you just store mappings of session IDs to user within Redis. Um, to me, that starts getting complicated, and unless your Redis server is weirdly overloaded or under spec'd, you shouldn't have an issue just storing the same user's data multiple times. So, um, yeah, hope that answers the question. Okay, all right, brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you.